Hello, everyone. This is uh, Gregory Anderson. I want to remind you that uh, we are recording these sessions. Uh, you can choose whether or not your camera is on by clicking the camera icon. Please use the chat for all questions. We'll be keeping track of them and we'll ask your questions out loud during the Q&A. We're offering this webinar with live Spanish interpretation for, for those who need it. To join the Spanish audio channel, just click the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen. Let the interpreter say, oh, can the interpreter please interpret that for me. Uh, if you have any issues with your interpretation, you can always put it, put your uh, issue into the chat. I'd like to introduce your uh, facilitators for today, Sam Anderson and Yolanda from uh, Cornell Corporate Extension. And so let's let's get started. Sam and Yolanda, I give you the floor. Great. Thank you so much. I'm going to start um, by sharing my screen. So like Gregory said, um, hi everyone. My name is Yolanda Gonzalez. I'm with Cornell Cooperative Extension and I'll be presenting today on our GINGER trials of 2020. So just a little bit of background. Um, we set up this GINGER trial at John Bowne High School. For those of you who don't know, it's in Flushing, Queens with the help of farmer educator, Jane Zhu. And um, we're growing this GINGER in five gallon poly grow bags using DSNY Fresh Kills compost as the growing medium. Um, we decided to use this compost because it's what is ex uh, readily accessible um, at the time in 2020 um, as the growing medium pre-pandemic. Um, so that was the reason why we wanted to use DSNY uh, Fresh Kills compost. And the idea behind this trial was that if it works well, it could be adapted for many different types of urban farms, especially um, uh, if you have some partial shade, it could be kind of set up off to the side. Um, and once it's set up, uh, there's not much maintenance that needs to happen other than keeping it irrigated um, and harvesting it in the fall. I hope I'm going slow enough for translation. Please let me know if I'm talking too fast. Uh, so a little bit about the timeline. Uh, we ordered the ginger right around this time last year um, from Biker Dude, certified organic um, Hawaiian clean seed. Um, and it's, like I mentioned, certified organic. And, and you have to get in your orders early. Often you'll get wait listed. So that's just a, a tip. Um, but ours just arrived, I think, last last week. Um, and this photo here is what the ginger looks like. You would put about eight um, seedlings per tray, and it would sprout um, for a few weeks and just have to make sure that it gets some um, next to a window, gets some light, and that you're watering it regularly. Um, in May, we uh, planted the ginger seed pieces in the five gallon bags, um, up, filled about halfway. We had 50 bags in total, and we decided that we were gonna have 25 bags planted with one seed piece per bag, and the other 25 um, with two seed pieces, just to see um, if there was a real difference between having one or two seed pieces per bag 
Um, and then at this point, we didn't add the nutrients yet. Um, when we go to do the trials this year, we'll probably do it all at once, add the compost and the nutrients at the same time um, into the bags. And then later in May, we came back, we added the nutrients, we um, installed drip irrigation. So this right here is what that drip irrigation looks like. Um, sort of wrapped it around the cinder block piece. Um, we held the ginger about two inches. And that's easy to do because the bags kind of fold up and down. Um, so you can keep hilling it as you go. Hilling it just means adding more compost. Um, so we added some sulfur, um, laminate, uh, potassium fertilizer, blood meal, nitrogen fertilizer. Um, and that was the, the ratios that we used. And again, we add blood meal because it's a fast acting organic option. Feather meal would also work if that's what you have on hand. And then um, in June, we hailed the ginger. Like I said, you're just adding more compost. And um, we had some irrigation lines that had been sort of uh, broken. So we fixed those. And then in July, again, just a little bit of maintenance, added more sulfur, checked on the irrigation, um, maybe weeded a little bit. Not a lot of weeds in these bags because the compost just doesn't have that many weed seeds. Um, and then from July till November, not much was done um, other than we had the irrigation set up on a timer. So that's that was really helpful. Um, and then we harvested the ginger uh, in, on November 3rd. And as you, you can see, it was right along the fence. So you have some goat pressure there. <laughs> That's not very common though on a lot of urban farms. But other than that, we didn't, we didn't have a lot of pests and disease issues. And the results, um, so this is our little scale. And this is what the marketable ginger root looks like. Um, and there wasn't a, a lot of difference between the bags that had two ginger seed pieces and the bags that had a single ginger seed piece. Um, as you can see here, eight pounds, two ounces for the single plants and about nine pounds for the, for the uh, bags of double plants. And then there were a few bags that um, had single pieces. I, I guess the other, the other, the second ginger seed piece didn't fully um, make it. And so that's why these ratios are sort of, or these numbers are off. It should be 25 and 25, but a few just didn't make, didn't um, make it to the two, two plants. Um, so yeah, again, as you can see, um, total yield of the rhizomes is about nine pounds. So there wasn't that much of a difference, but um, it, that could partly be because at some points, the, because the, we had issues with the irrigation. So we're, we're looking to redo this trial this year and we'll report back on, um, on whether certain growing conditions affected the total amount of marketable um, ginger. So I'll let um, Sam take over from here and just talk about a few case studies looking at a few examples on urban farms of how people have grown ginger um, in their operations. Hello, thanks Yolanda. Um, my name is Sam Anderson and I am, uh, along with Yolanda, I'm the other urban agriculture specialist um, with Cornell Cooperative Extension here in New York City. Um, and so this was, um, Yolanda actually made this slide, but this person is my mom. Um, <laughs> Yolanda made this slide when I was on parental leave, in honoring my time off, very good coworker. And my mom was like, you, you, your coworker called, Yolanda called me or uh, texted or whatever. Anyway, so um, uh, the, when we started talking about ginger, I was talking with my mom about it back in Ohio and she grew it in a couple of homemade, um, little high tunnels and she actually in this turmeric and the one on the left there um 
and she grew enough in those little two little tunnels to make a thousand dollars off of it in rural Ohio. So um, that was one thing, you know, to just to see that that's possible makes you think, I wonder what we could do in the city. Um, but I don't have great numbers for her. But anyways, that that's one way of doing it would be you can make your own high tunnel pretty easily. Well, I don't know if it's pretty easily, but it's pretty cheaply. Um, and that's the kind of thing you could do on an urban farm as well. Um, but next slide, please. Oh. Sorry, Yolanda, can, I, I can't get it to go to the next slide. Oh, there we are. Thanks. Um, so here in the city, as part of when we ordered this, uh, these ginger seeds, um, we uh, last spring we ordered more than the, the minimum order is 15 pounds from this place um, and that was more than we needed so um, 15 pounds is something like 150 seed pieces so in addition to the 80 or so that we needed um, we gave out uh, some of the remaining stuff and one of the places that grew it was um, Project Eat at, at Wards Island Urban Farm they grew it in high tunnel alongside tomatoes to so sort of companion planted, which is one way you might see it grown also. Like if some people grow ginger in the Hudson Valley. This is a lot of times how it's grown is in a high tunnel. So um, they got um, a similar yield to what we got uh, on, a, as, on a per plant basis. Um, so it's still not as much as we'd necessarily want, like to, to sort of make it make some money, but in this case, it was really low maintenance for them. They just um, put it in alongside the tomatoes. It didn't take up space that would have gone to anything else necessarily. Um, I don't think they did extra hilling. They didn't add extra fertilizer. So having done those things probably would have made a, a higher yield, but it, but you know, on the plus side, it was low maintenance. Uh, next slide, please. So we, oh, there we are. Um, so another place that, that grew it last year was uh, Kelly Street Garden. Renee might, uh, what well, Renee is talking after us. So, um, and uh, so they put it in um, these two big, uh, big grow bags, sort of like cloth or landscape fabric type grow bags, um, and really packed it in there. So a lot of plants packed in, as you can see in the picture on the right, especially. Um, and it came out, the weight was for the whole plant. So um, about the same as the weight that we got and that Wards Island got, but in this case it was for the whole plant. So probably um, the, you know, so the rhizome part, which is the part that, that's the especially valuable part, that was probably a pretty low yield. Um, and this might just be because they were, you know, there's a lot of them all packed together. And Renee might talk about it later, but I know that they were talking about um, trying to grow it a different way this year, maybe in the in the beds or in or, or giving them more space, um, which makes sense that that would probably that you probably would get more roots when there's more space for that. But the the leaves are also uh, you know part of it. Um, you don't don't necessarily see them in the grocery store, but you can make tea, and um, I know people will buy the leaves if you if you you know find the right uh, market for it. So that's you know the whole plant is potentially something you could you can sell or use yourself. Um, and they did, and also at Kelly Street, they sprouted, they did a really good job sprouting the, the seed pieces. Um, and this year, when we do our trial, similar to the one we did at John Bowd, we're gonna do it at New Roots in the Bronx um, and, at, and Kelly Street's where they're gonna sprout it. So, um, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, another place that grew last year was Hellgate Farm um, on these, these uh, in these rooftop beds. They also did it as a sort of companion planting alongside tomatoes. Um, similarly, I think that, I don't think it healed it. Um, I don't think it added any fertilizer that they wouldn't have already been giving it. The tomatoes, tomatoes need enough that that might be, that might also work just fine. Um, ginger does seem like it needs, it, it needs a bit of fertilizer probably, like probably, that's the reason that we added some uh, compost so like in addition to compost, because fresh kills, the DSNY compost and fresh kills is very, it's got a lot of wood chips. Anyone who's worked with it, you guys probably 
no, you know, it, it feels almost more like a mulch than a compost sometimes. So um, it, it probably, it might work really well for this as long as you can add some, a little bit of fertilizer, especially nitrogen and potassium. Um, so anyway, they, uh, they grew it there. We, they didn't get a, a weight on the final yield, but they felt pretty good about it. And I know they're saving some of these plants over the winter to try and um, gr grow them from their own seeds next year or this year, rather. Uh, next slide, please. So at Oco Farms, um, Yemi was already growing it. So these aren't seed pieces from us, but she was already growing it. Um, both ginger and turmeric. And that's, by the way, you, you might hear that a lot. Ginger and turmeric a lot of times sort of go hand in hand in, in that, like they're grown in a similar way. A lot of the same, you, you'd you do it similarly for either one. You'd, you'd um, hill it up, you'd try and get a long growing season. Um, so they're similar crops, so that's why ginger and turmeric pop up alongside each other a lot. Um, so, uh, so Yemi was talking about how, how they did it. Um, they just got ginger from the grocery store. So this is a way that a lot of people will do it at, um, at home. In fact, I see, I just saw a question in the chat. Robert A asked that very question. Can you use ginger from the grocery store? Uh, you can, right here you see them doing it. Um, the reason that we didn't, and the reason that most people growing enough that they want to sell it, um, is that, well, A, that it's, you can get a, it, it might be more cost effective to buy 15 pounds at once if you're going to grow that much. If you're going to have 150 ginger plants. Um, and actually their minimum order is smaller now. Now it's like 10 or even five, but you, you save money if you buy 10 pounds. Anyway, still a lot, 100 plants is still a lot. Um, so there's that, but the other reason is because this source that, that we were buying it from, and it's the same source that this Hawaii organic ginger, um, in fact, let me pop a link into their website, which also, uh, this is linked to the growing guide that they have on their website, which is a great growing guide for ginger. And also that's, where we bought it from. Um, uh, they're in high demand, like a lot of people are buying from them because they, you, um, it's a like a, a clean source of seed, of ginger seed, and that's a big deal because the stuff in the grocery store, or if you just sort of buy it without knowing where it's coming from, it might come in with bacterial wilt on it. And so a lot of stuff, it can grow out, it can be enough, a little bit of that wilt on the stuff in the grocery store, um, the farmer who grew that ginger probably wouldn't replant it themselves, but there it's okay to sell. It's okay to eat, but it's not okay to grow because once you have that bacterial wilt in, or I mean, it's okay to, to get to grow, but you're taking a risk. So if it has bacterial wilt, that will kill your ginger plant. It'll just die really rapidly and suddenly. I haven't seen it, but this is what people talk about. Um, just in the middle of the summer at some point, it just really, it just wilts and dies. And then that organism stays in the soil for years, um, like seven years or more. Um, even without growing more ginger there, it, somehow, it manages to stick around for a really long time. So that's the risk you take. And that's the reason that we didn't grow ginger from the grocery store. Um, but if you're just doing it at home in a garden or in a pot, then, you know, if that pot ends up with bacterial wilt, just grow something other than ginger and you'll be fine. Because it's specific to ginger and related stuff. So if you grow cucumbers or whatever, it's not going to affect that. Um, so, you know, low risk if, you, if it's a garden, but, but high risk if it's a farm. And anyway, so it, it worked okay for them. They, this is a very different setup. This is an aquaponic setup and they're growing it here in this, this is like expanded clay. So it's, it's sort of like little pebbles that hold water well. Um, and it, it grew, it grew there. I mean, a lot of stuff grows in that medium. So it's interesting, it's different. Um, I don't think we have weights or anything. Let me try the next slide. This one, these are the leftover seed pieces that were small and look like they maybe weren't going to sprout. I just stuck them in some pots along with the leftover soil or the leftover uh, compost and put them out in front of my apartment and uh, out by the trash cans. This is the only place I had to put them and they grew and they did better than I thought they would have. Um, this is nothing special. I would just go out with a 
you know, with a gallon of water and water them whenever I remembered to. Um, they got full sunlight in the morning and very and, and pretty much full shade in the afternoon. Um, there wasn't room to hill them after like beyond maybe one time. Uh, one thing that was different was I and I don't have a numbers, but I added a little bit of extra fertilizer partway through the year just because I had some on hand. Um, so they did pretty well. Uh, I think the rhizomes in the bottom right corner is before I washed it, just like what it looked like pulling it out of the pot. Um, it was decent size. I didn't have a scale to weigh it, but it was more than I thought it would be, but maybe similar to what we got at John Bowne. Um, but this was a couple, I waited another couple weeks before harvesting. Um, so that plus the fertilizer might have helped it a little bit. And uh, I guess that's it for that slide. What I should have included was um, a photo of how I processed it. So this was something I did get this, like a credit to my mom for figuring this out, which was that, um, so to clarify, we're harvesting it as fresh ginger. So the stuff you see on a grocery store shelf is usually stored storage ginger. It's like m more mature and cured. So it can live, uh, it has a long shelf life. Fresh ginger um, is what we get when we're harvesting it you know, in November. Um, if we wanted it to be that kind with like a tougher skin, it would go, we'd have to wait all the way till January, February. Um, I like that somebody's drawing scribbles on the slide. <laughs> um, it's not me. Anyway, we can still read. Uh, and uh, so anyways, that's just a clarification that what we're harvesting here is fresh ginger. And it's, it's harder to find the grocery store because it has a, little, a shorter shelf life, but it's, it's a really, it, it has like a milder, sweeter taste, I think. And it, people use it a lot for candied ginger, for pickling, and also for cooking. And so one way you can do it is to um, peel it, which is, which is pretty easy with fresh ginger compared to the stuff with like the tough skin. Um, it's pretty easy to just um, like, like scrub the peel off with your hands and, or scrub the skin off with your hands. And then you can pop it into a food processor and grind it up and then put in little teaspoons um, or tablespoons, whatever size, I guess I did tablespoons, little scoops, and you freeze them as those little scoops, stick them in a Ziploc bag, and then whenever you want it, you have a tablespoon of ginger, or fresh ginger, ready to ready to go. It freezes really well. So anyways, that's a little pro tip. The lessons we learned uh, from this year were, first is to make sure you order the seeds early, because th this place in particular runs out. Um, so uh, they'll send an email, you go get on their email list and they let you know when they're going to, when orders open up and then you get up early and may and place the order. My wife referred to it as our Beyonce tickets. Um, so they had to get up and like get up early and click refresh until it came up and everything. I don't think it's probably as high demand as that, but you, you do want to not, um, not sit on it. You want to plan ahead and make sure you order when they're available. Um, and we ordered and they, and they came last week. So I've got, got th three bags right here. In fact, I can show you what, when we say seed pieces or we, we say seed, um, similar to something like garlic or potatoes, where we say seed, we're really referring to something like this. So a, a piece of ginger root. The whole ginger root is like a big, you know, a big hand. And so this is, they, cut off chunks of it. So each chunk is a plant. So they can come in a lot of different sizes. Some are small, some are pretty big. So if you're, if you're doing it yourself, then there's a, you know, there's a, a, apparently a skill to knowing where to make the cuts. And I have no idea how you do that, but the company does it for us so, or the, you know, the supplier does. Um, anyway, so uh, Yolanda mentioned next time we, we were going to incorporate the fertilizer from the start rather than um, I mean, just, yeah, rather than trying to do it later, so it's easier. Um, one thing that we could have done better was to keep up with, with hilling it up. So the idea, if you're growing it like outside in a row, you would dig a trench and then every couple of weeks you'd scoop a little bit more in. Uh, for us in these bags, we rolled down the sides and then you'd, you'd roll up the sides a little bit, scoop in more compost. So you'd have extra uh, compost or soil off to the side, scoop in more, unroll it a little more each time until it's you know, all the way, 
unrolled. We just couldn't get out there often enough to keep up with it. So we, I think, only hailed it two or three times, but not not frequently enough, probably. Um, and it's not, you know, the plant's going to still grow fine if you don't. It's just that every time you hill it, it's like potatoes. Every time you hill it, it stretches out the rhizome, so you get more of that root. Um, and then for uh, irrigation, we had trouble um, because there, there was like an, the, the drip got turned off at some point. Um, there were a couple of like ir irrigation interruptions, and so that probably stunted the growth. Um, I mean, it, I'm, it, I'm sure it stunted the growth. Uh, to some extent. Um, partial shade, um, so ginger can grow in par partial shade. That's one of the potential benefits. Um, and, you know, we had that in mind that it can grow in these bags. You can move them around. You can stick them off to the side. Uh, it doesn't have to take up a bed where you're growing something else already, um, but it still needs some sunlight. So I won, I mean, one possible reason why the stuff out in front of, you know, that I put out in front of the apartment might have done almost as well or just as well as the stuff in the bags, it might have just been that it had full direct sunlight all morning, whereas those ones, the tree ended up ha casting more shade than we realized it would, I think. It, um, and so they did, may, might not have gotten quite as much sunlight as they should have in that spot. Um, and then the last thing is uh, we we're thinking about experimenting with bigger bags or, or, or otherwise just there's still an open question about um, should you go two or one in, in one of these bags? And we definitely know that overcrowding is going to limit um, how much root you get, how much of the you know plant growth you get. So, um, so yeah, that's the other thought is just trying to avoid overcrowding. That's a good point. And yeah, I guess I should. I think we're stop about there mm -hmm. because it looks like we're almost at twelve thirty, and I, I don't know if we wanted to do Q and A now or if we we're waiting to do it all at the end. Um, but I see a lot of questions in the chat. Maybe we can go through and try and answer them individually or something. Um, I think we were gonna do the ginger Q&A right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll start. Um, could you plant the ginger with other nightshades or was there something particular about tomatoes? Um, I can say the people who grew it with tomatoes, um, it, it wasn't, yeah, I think it was just because that was where they had a place to put it. And because tomatoes, they knew they would be there all year and ginger is going to be there all year. Like you plant it in, you know, May and you harvest it in November. So you wouldn't plant it next to like carrots or something that's going to be disturb, disturbing it. So it, no, it doesn't, it's not about the it, cucumbers would have worked, anything like that. And I think the reason they did tomatoes is because the tomatoes are trained upwards. So they were on a, like, they weren't casting too much shade on the ginger. But no reason you couldn't try it alongside something else as long as you, um, yeah, you could, it's nothing specific about tomatoes. Thanks, but Sam. Um, another question. When the ginger spout, sprouts are planted outdoors in the five gallon bags, how deep are you initially planting? For example, are you planting in one gallon or two gallon of compost to leave room for hilling later in the season? I don't remember how you remember much. Remember Yolanda? Yeah, I'm trying yeah. to remember. It's something like two gallons, I think, that we started with. That doesn't mean that's the right way to do it. If anything, yeah. we probably, we probably this year would probably want to start with more. Mm -hmm. I would think because to give more room for that, because there's the rhizome, which is the part that you harvest, and then there's all these extra roots that it's sending out, and so you want room for those roots as well. Mm -hmm. But I agree. I think we'd add more this year. I would say like roughly maybe two full shovel shovelfuls um, initially, and then just keep adding it as as you go along. Great, thanks. Um, next question: What about critters? Do squirrels and raccoons like this plant? I have to say that. Um, when we grew uh, the ginger, it was actually on top of landscape fabric um, and it was in a fenced in area. So for the most part, there was protection against um, critters and potential squirrels and raccoons. So that we'll, we'll know if we have an issue with that um, since this year we'll, we'll do some outside and then also in greenhouses. But Sam, do you remember if there were 
a lot of pest, pest pressures. I don't remember seeing any significant signs of it. And I can even say the stuff in front of the apartment here, um, we don't have squirrels out there and we don't usually have raccoons out there, but we do have rats and they nibbled on something else I grew out there and they didn't touch the ginger. So that's one example where nothing bothered them. They shouldn't be bothered too much by other things um, because they have such a strong flavor that, that you know, that's their defense against most um, animals that aren't as curious as humans. Thanks. Uh, another question, which fertilizer did you use? Oh, I was gonna go back. So that was an initial slide. And to clarify, the reason we had these specific fertilizers was to not add extra phosphorus, just because we figured the compost had a lot of phosphorus already based on previous soil tests. Um, but you could just add a standard fertilizer and you know, probably be totally, that would, be, that would be a much easier way to do it. Mm -hmm. Just like a standard NPK type of fertilizer if you wanted. Yeah, so like we mentioned, we use blood meal, but if you have a feather meal, that could act, that could work as well. Um, and then laminate uh, potassium fertilizer and sulfur. So those are the amendments that we added, the nutrients and amendments. And the potassium, um, the other thing, you could use um, uh, potassium sulfate or sulfur of potash, and that is... And in that case, you use half the amount of what we used here. Or that's what um, we would have used. It, it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is Greg. I hate to uh, interrupt, but we do need to move on to um, the Sparrow Crops Workshop. Uh, we may be able to come back and answer more questions uh, for both uh, workshops. But... Uh, and everyone is also welcome to continue this conversation in the chat or in the Slack. Yeah. So I would like to uh, thank uh, Sam and Yolanda for their uh, beautiful workshop. Thank and you. now I would like to uh, introduce Renee. Let me spotlight her. There you go. Hi, Renee. How are you doing? Can you all hear me? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so let we me just share you. my screen. So this is about the crop trials of the diaspora at Kelly Street Garden. Um, one thing I'd like to say before I start is to acknowledge that I have the privilege of saying it's a crop trial. In reality, for many, this is actually a way of life. They have to do it. It's survival. Um, the indigenous, the enslaved, indentured peoples, they had to do it because the land they reside on is arid, lacking in nutrients and mortar. So I'm lucky enough to be able to do that. Um, so our first crop trial was in 2019. We overwintered moringa, hibiscus, and mayor lemon trees. It worked for a while, but we weren't able to keep the temperature at a steady rate, um, at least 65 degrees. The one thing that, the two things that actually survived were the mayor lemon trees, because we put them in the windowsill. So they were able to get six to eight hours of sunlight, and the majority of the time, the temperature remained stable. Everything else died. So after that, we're going to what is pigeon peas. So Dr. Sherrod Patak of the University of Georgia developed these varieties. Um, I first heard about them in July of actually Just Food 2016, and they were having a Caribbean crop trial workshop. Uh, so these originally came to Mohamed Farouz. He's formerly of co-op of Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk, and him and David Vigil gave a workshop at Just Food that year. Um, today, they're sold by True Love Seeds, where half of the profits go back to East New York Farms. So some of the names of pigeon peas, 
Kanjan is Cajun, Congo P, Angola P, Red Gram in India, Ahur or Tor Dal in Hindi, Tufaram Harupu in Tamil, Pua Congo in Haiti or Gandules. Uh, the origins 3,500 years ago in 3,500 in India. It's a perennial in other zones that can last from three to five years. Here, as of now, it's an annual. So as I said before, March 2016 went to just food. Uh, so we began growing after that. So the crop trial in the prior year, 2019, I grew it in my bed at Lydia's Magic Garden. And we grew some at Kelly Street. The majority of it was usually grown at New Roots. So we did a few, it worked at Kelly Street. We got them in a little late, but we were able to get some harvest from it. So after that, 2020, we planted a full bed. Uh, we planted on both sides of the bed and we were able to get an excellent crop. Uh, the one thing we also have to think about for the future is wind. So Isaiz brought a lot of it almost down. And so this year we're most likely going to use bamboo and make a basket weed. That way it will stabilize the crop. So if we have a lot of wind or some kind of thunderstorm, tornado, we don't have to worry about it going down. So that, as I said, is why we stabilized the crop this year. Our last harvest was Wednesday, December 2nd. Uh, we saved some for seed, but mostly it's our harvest. It goes in our farm share which is usually Saturday, which begins the second, which begins right after July 4th. So whatever Saturday that is, that's when we begin. And the monarch butterflies love to see hang around the um, pigeon bees. And the last slide is actually after their, um, after I started saving seeds for them. I find it really relaxing to shell the piece. Uh, the next thing is jute known as Molokahaya, Nalta Jute, Tosa Jute, Jute Mallow, Egyptian Spinach, West African Sorrel. Jute Mallow thought to have been cultivated by um, people of Sephardic origin. At the same time, if you're looking for it as a crop, actually use Molokahaya as what you're looking for. Whenever you say jute in any search engine, it always comes up as a fiber. So the origins, they're not sure. It might be Africa or Asia. Um, jute leaf as a vegetable contains an abundance of antioxidants that have been associated with protection from chronic diseases such as heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and hypertension. Um, so the trial 2018 were first grew it as a crop. Uh, Rose was very helpful in that. It started growing very long and thin. What she told us when that happens, it should grow more like a shrub. So cut it in half. Uh, 2020, we planted four plants in July and we were lucky enough to actually get a harvest. Um, we weren't sure whether the seeds would come because it was starting, the weather was starting to dip. Uh, usually six weeks after flowering, seed is produced. Um, the first week of October, the seeds came, but then also the frost came after that. So some of the seeds actually froze on the vine but actually after it warmed up, we got a large, we got a very large crop and we were able to collect it. Um, the next thing is bisac, known as Jamaican sorrel, roselle, hibiscus, banchada in Nepal, grosella in Paraguay, zobo by Nigerians, and aqua de flor de, Me de Jamaica in Mexico. So the origins is West African, the leaves and calyx have both vegetables and medicinal values. They use fresh for making wine, juice, jam, jelly, syrup, gelatin, and pudding. Cakes, ice cream, and flavors. And also dried and brewed into tea, spice, and used for butter, pies, sauces, and tarts. The leaves are antimicrobial. It has been used to treat lung disease, persistent cough, sore throat, and leaves used as a poultice to stop bleeding. Um, the one thing about the trials is we got a lot of leaves. Um, we actually have two plants. This is the most, uh, the largest plant. Uh, one we did in a container. That's where we were able to get some seed from, but this large plant, we got no seeds, I mean, very little. 
Uh, so they were delicious. We used them as wraps, but that was it. So this year, we believe we'll have to plant it sooner. And we'll also be putting a trellis behind it because after Isaiah's as well, it started turning over. And so we'll have to uh, also put it to a trellis, tie it to a trellis to make sure it stayed up. And we'll be planting it behind the bed, not in, in the bed itself. That will also give us more room for crops. And this year we also planted lemongrass. Um, this is the first year we did it here. It's also known as oil grass, fever grass, in Simbongan in India. Um, its origins, it has been grown and cultivated in Asia, particularly in India, Sri Lanka, and the Philippines, where the locals combined it with other herbs to create medicinal tonics, which they call fever tea. It was then administered to patients with fever, stomach aches, irregular menstruation, and diarrhea. Um, it's also thought to have been used by Indians for thousands of years to treat fungal infections. It was believed that lemongrass oil has been exported as early as 17th century by the Philippines, which Filipinos called tanglao. However, lemongrass wasn't commercially cultivated until 1947 in Haiti and Florida, after people discovered how to extract citronella oil. It was displayed at the World's Fair in 1951, where it be quickly became popular. Um, we received the lemongrass from Mill Creek Gardens. Um, they also brought some other plants here. People picked them up from here. Um, most of the plants have resided in crates. Some of the health benefits, they've been found to be a remedy for those suffering from cramps, headaches, dizziness, for people under stress. An excellent blood cleanser and can be very beneficial when used as part of a periodic cleansing program. Reputed to show this to slow discharge of mucus in respiratory conditions. Um, one thing we found out is that it was extremely popular with everyone. So we'll plant more of it this year. Um, we also have two mayor lemon trees. Right now they're residing in the window cells of the community rooms. Um, that allows you to have six to eight hours of sunlight per day. At the same time, it's done better this year. We haven't shed as much leaves as we did last year. Um, we water it whenever it needs water. So I just stick my finger in it up to about three inches. If it's dry, then I water it. If not, I don't. Um, at the same time, to make sure water doesn't go all over the place, there are plastic bags under it that's able to keep the water in. Um, some of the health benefits. Um, lemons are an overall medicinal power. Uh, may treat and protect against cold, flu, inflammation, indigestion, constipation, skin problems such as acne, oily skin, dandruff, respiratory disorders, throat infections, minor burns, detoxifier, blood cleanser, and an immune enhancer. So this is 2019, that's when we started the mayor lemon trees. Um, basically we first saved the seeds, fermented it, and then we placed it in a small grow pot and then just kept up potting it until it now rests in a container. The one thing we do is we keep it about 65 degrees. And as I said before, it hasn't shed as many leaves as it did last year. So it's in pretty good condition. Um, we also planted Central African eggplant. It was lovely. Um, last 2019, um, we had only one eggplant actually grow. We saved the seeds. In 2020, we thought we'd try to be more successful. We did 18 transplant, no flowers, nothing. So basically, we won't be doing that again. If we do it, it most likely will be a container and hopefully and put it like situated where it is in the most sunlight in the garden, that may help it. Or possibly do it in new roots since it has direct sunlight. It might be better to actually plant it there. Um, so Sam told you about our ginger trial. So it's also called black ginger, cochin, Jimbre, Jamaican ginger. Its health benefits, warm blood vascular stimulant and body cleansing herb. It's also used in respiratory and lung chest clearing combinations. It's a digestive system stimulant, reducing effect of migraines, headaches, without the side effects found in other drugs. Um, recommended by herbalists as a, regular, as a regulator of blood cholesterol to improve blood circulation. Um, we grew it in trays under grow lights until April. So we just put some soil, potting soil on the bottom, put ginger on top of it, and then just covered it. 
as the leaves started to grow, we just started adding more soil, more actually more compost. Um, we put 15 in two trays, and then we eventually transferred those to grow bags. Um, those grow bags, we put some compost in the bottom, put some, put the um, ginger on top of it, added more compost, and after leaves grow, kept hilling and hilling until it came to what it was. Um, we just used DSNA compost. Um, we didn't do anything else for it. No supplements, no amendments, nothing. So we harvested prior to the leaves turning yellow because it kept raining and we didn't know when that would happen. So we have nine pounds including leaves. We didn't do the rhizomes. Um, basically we didn't do that separately because you can actually use the leaves as well, which is something Sam also told you about. So we dried them and used the seeds as tea. I suggest you cut it down beforehand. Um, I have a tea ball, so I mix it with the lemongrass and it's a good tea. At the same time, you can use the tea with a um, wicker basket. And so you put the leaves down and you can make fish and you can basically infuse the fish with a flavor of ginger doing it that way. And so that's all. Some of the books to learn about herbal um, treatments are Herb Covey, um, African-American Slave Medicine, uh, Working Cures by Charlotte Fett, and Working the Roots, Over 400 Years of Traditional African-American Healing by Michelle Lee. Um, the Little Herb Encyclopedia, the Handbook of Nature's Remedies for a Healthier Life, you can also use as well. So if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Renee. That was a great presentation. Okay. Um, first question we have is how do you eat and prepare the jute and how do you preserve the jute and the pigeon peas? Um, the pigeon peas, we basically harvest. Um, you can also let them go dry out as well. So basically that's in another room, basically in the processing room where we dry herbs, that's done there. And then I shell the peas. Uh, some people like them dry to use and that's when they make their peas and rice. Um, other people actually use the whole thing as it is. So as it's harvested, they basically use it as put it in their rice or whatever they want to use it with and use it that way. So you can decide to dry it and then do peas and rice, or you can make the decision as it is and just use it there. So you just basically shell it and open it up and that's it. For the jute, what I did to get that is I used parchment paper and I put the seeds down, I put another piece of parchment paper over it, and then I use a bowl, and then I just mold the bowl to side to side, or you can use a rolling pin. It will just simply bust open, and then I just take the um, parchment paper, and then I pour it into the bowl, and from there, I just put it in a, uh, and from there, I just put it in a jar, which is what I have here. Um, so that's basically how I do that. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, next question is, how much space do all of these plants need? Uh, how tall do they grow? Um, the jute can grow anywhere from three feet on up. Um, so in some cases, we also have a rear part of the garden, which is we're doing a pollinator area. So we can actually also put them in there, or you can put them in the back of your raised beds. So they're not getting in the way of anything else. So you can make a decision to do that. We have beds that are in the middle, and then we also have beds that are against the building. So that gives us the ability to also plant uh, in the medicinal beds. So they'll actually get direct sunlight and not be in the way of other plants. Thanks. Okay. Uh, next question, are the Molokia leaves edible? Uh, yes, it is edible. Um, it's like calico. Um, so if you go to nyc.tufts, um, there's a recipe there given by Rose, and um, she has a recipe there. She used it for callaloo, but it can also be adapted for use as for jute as well. Um, another person wanted to know, how about trying the eggplant in pots? That's a good idea. Um, we most likely do that this year. So trying it in pot, it keeps it out of the way of everything else we're doing. Um, okay, 
Another person would like to know where they can get the seeds. Um, for the jutes, um, they might be on True Love Seeds, but you can also email me at, or email kellystreet.com. I think I left my, con I'll put my contact information in there and I'll be able to give you some seeds. Um, also, you'll find the pigeon peas on True Love Seeds. They're also selling it there. Thank you for that. Um, with planting the Meyer lemon, what do you mean by fermenting the seed? Um, basically, I put it in mortar and the seeds that are the most dense go down to the bottom. Anything that's light, I take off. They're not very dense, so they most likely wouldn't be very strong. So those are the ones I'm going to let dry. Once I've done that, then I plant those. And I plant those in smaller containers. As it grows larger, I plant them in larger containers until they finally reside in the containers that they are in today. Great, thank you. Uh, are there any workshops on recognizing and saving seeds? Um, that's something we might do this year, I'm not sure. But you should also go to, on Instagram, She Saves Seeds. Um, that's Jacqueline Pilati. I mean, it was originally known as the Ethnobotany Project and we claim seeds, it's now at that, is its new um, Instagram handle. So those are things we do. Um, Green Thumb last year was gonna have a, uh, a seed saving workshop. That's most likely something we may do later in the year. But I'm not sure yet. We're still trying to figure out the things we're going to do as part of it. And how much compost were you using? Uh, one person wanted to know if it was all compost or what the ratio was. All compost. Um, that's something that Sam suggested to us and we're going with it. Um, this year, another suggestion Sam and Yolanda have made is not to put so many in. So we're getting more grow bags um, so and put less in it because we put all 15 in two grow bags. And somebody was wondering if you could put your book recommendations into the chat as well. Okay, so I'll do that as well. Uh, let me do that. And I believe we are all caught up on questions. If anyone else has more questions, please put them in the chat now and I can ask Renee. Oh, and a new question just came up. What was the most satisfying plant to grow for you? Uh, pigeon peas. I love, I love rice and peas. It's my favorite thing. It's my comfort food. So it was the thing I loved the most. And thank you for adding all those resources to the chat. Okay. Welcome, Anna. Nice to see you. <laughs> uh, another person wanted to know how big are the pigeon pea plants? What's the height and the width? Um, some of them got to be 12 inches, but that's because we planted it in the back and also because there's a tree hanging over it. Uh, it didn't get as large as the other one. The other one's got, let's see, taller than me, about two feet about two to three feet. Uh, do I give classes at other gardens? I don't know yet. I'm not sure what I'm gonna do this year. My main base is actually Kelly Street Garden, even though I am a community gardener at other gardens in the city. So if you wanna know if we're gonna do classes, anything, um, look at the Instagram handle at Kelly Street Green. That's the best way to find out what we're doing. And also, we also have a web page. So that helps. And also follow Kelly Street on Facebook as well. So things, what we do, workshops or anything, it'll be posted there. Right now, we're still working out what we're going to do this year. But I think we're also going to do mushrooms. But we're working nice. on that too. And Yolanda um, is helping us out on that one. 
And another question was, do you recommend true love for lemongrass seeds? Um, if they have it, yes, but you can also get them from MI Gardener. But also if you go to NYC Tufts, you'll find a list of other, guard, of other um, seeds, places you can get seeds. Another place I suggest is Seeds Mail. Um, one thing you should, sub you should subscribe to their newsletter. Uh, what tends to happen is quite, um, she goes out fast. So when she says she's going to post, don't wait for the email. Get on that email. Get on her listing, her website that day. And the minute she posts, start buying. And also on Instagram, she's meant to grow. But if you look at nyctufts.org, um, we have a resource page, and you'll find a lot of that in them. So if you want um, to support BIPOC, you'll also find it there. We specifically did that for a reason. And also Black Farmers Nationwide, you'll also find a lot of these listings there as well. And you'll meet a lot of other people. You don't only have to be a person of BIPOC to be there. It's for everyone. Thank you so much, Renee. I think it's time to wrap this workshop up. Um, we can also continue the conversation in the Slack and I'll post that right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, hi everyone. This is Greg again. Um, first, I'd like to thank all the facilitators, um, Yolanda and Sam and Renee, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, this was a great workshop. Uh, I'm excited to uh, continue to grow ginger and use some of your ideas. Um, let's see. Uh, I would also like to thank the interpreters. Thank you. And all of the uh, participants, thank you all for showing up and participating and, and asking questions. Um, <clears throat> I would like to remind everyone of our next session is at 6 p.m. Uh, research and record rec research and record keeping with the librarians at the New York Botanical Garden. Yes, it is. So thank everyone. Uh, thank you again, Sam, Renee, and Yolanda. And we look forward to uh, hearing more from you.